you can see amongst us here, I wanted us to be a little closer, a, a tight-knit family here, uh, in hopes that we can have uh, a bit of a discussion after I blab and talk for maybe about 30 minutes or so, because I'd really like this session to be something about uh, cross-dialogue, different people that are building businesses and trying to find ways to also make the world uh, of Joomla and beyond uh, a better place. So I'll start uh, today by giving a little bit of an overview as to what I have in my presentation here. And then it would be great to have this be an opportunity where we can share each of our own lessons learned for business models, what we're doing in our own communities, and even some challenges that we're facing because there's a lot of good folks here doing really great things. And if there's a way for us to share and learn before we leave in unfortunately an hour or so, I think that'd be a great takeaway for the end of the event. Sound good to you guys? Okay. All righty. Okay, so first things first, uh, you may have noticed that I changed the title of this presentation, uh, and I hope you all don't mind. What I had before, uh, is the projector off just a little bit maybe? I don't know if I can twist slightly. Oh, I guess that's not the projector. <laughs> it's my Mac probably. That's fine. The first, yeah, the first letters are never important, right? We'll just figure it out. <laughs> Uh, so before I called uh, this presentation Building a Business Outside the Joomla Sphere, uh, now it's Saving the World while, while Building a Joomla Business. Oh, yes. Oh, the wrong session. Sorry. Thank you for coming. Uh, you'll see later on uh, what I mean by that. <laughs> uh, so the question here is uh, why the change? What, what happened? Um, so I grew up and live uh, a good portion of my life in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, anybody from California? Have anybody been to California? Yeah, oh, this is great, okay. So it's an amazing place, uh, but there's a challenge. And the challenge is that if you are a kid growing up in the Bay Area, you have to make an important decision. And that decision is, do you love the Oakland A's or do you love the San Francisco Giants? These are two baseball teams out there. Uh, and so for uh, a lot of my life, I was a big Oakland A's fan. And I had to make that decision of saying, do I get to hang out with my friends that are also San Francisco Giants fans? Can I play for both of these teams? Or is it something that I have to, to make a decision on? Uh, and this is the distance between the two cities. It's just separated by a narrow in the bay and one bay bridge. I, I would like to say, for those of you watching at home, uh, that it was the Oakland A's that beat the San Francisco Giants in the World Series in 1989, the famous Earthquake World Series. Uh, so that made me very happy. Uh, so I've also been playing two, uh, for two teams uh, in my PicNet business world, as well as my Joomla open source uh, world. And this is something that has been a, uh, a good exercise in cross-training for the last five years, six years. Uh, and there's a lot of knowledge that I picked up that could be useful for us as uh, business owners and people creating value in the Joomla community that we can take far beyond what we're doing in the Joomla project. Uh, so just one more time to reflect. I remember back in the day that I was president. I'm not that anymore. Uh, and now I live in the land of retirement here. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Louis Landry wrote me what I thought was a very serious email. It was very short. He just, I forgot what the subject line was, but it said something like, um, we didn't see you at last Friday's backgammon game. Uh, we hope to see you at uh, the chess game in the retirement home later next week. Uh, so it's, it's a fun place to be. Uh, we hang out outside a lot. Uh, and I also get time now uh, when I'm not traveling overseas as much anymore to go to great places uh, like this. This is Acadia National Park in Maine, so way in the northeast corner of the United States. Beautiful, great hiking, and I love doing that stuff, and I haven't had the chance to do it for at least a couple of years. Uh, and as a California native, it is so wonderful to be able to get back out in the wilderness and do some hiking. Uh, and it's given me a lot of opportunity to start thinking about what are we doing, not just acting, not just going out, well, literally acting with sunglasses on and dancing up here, but what are we doing as a community and as individual businesses that are making the Joomla world as well as the larger world a better place? 
So my focus first was just thinking about us as business owners, as entrepreneurs, as people here in the Joomla world, and that was going to be the point of my presentation. Uh, and then I thought, you know, there's got to be something more that we can be doing that's going beyond just that. And what I realized is that while I was the president of Open Source Matters and involved in the Joomla project, as well as when I was at the same time CEO of our company, uh, PicNet, uh, I had a different role, but I actually had very similar values. And a lot of you have seen this slide, and this is very important to me, and it carries on through business. This slide says to me, uh, the relationships that we build with people are more important than the tools. The things we're doing for our environment and what our place is in the world is more important than just the technology. So it's been three days of technology and I thought it'd be great to wrap this up with thinking beyond the technology and how we can all leave here uh, finding ways to make a better impact in the world together. Uh, so this is going to be a little tough to see, but uh, this is kind of a pseudo-evolutionary timeline, if you want to call it that. And I use this because our lifetimes and humankind on this planet is, bit, is just a, a small segment, a very tiny, tiny, almost irrelevant slice of the universe of this Earth. Uh, we're, we're really rather irrelevant, except for a lot of the damage and hopefully some of the good we can be doing uh, into the future. Uh, and one of the guys that I admire most, John Muir, uh, who protected a lot of the national parks in the United States, uh, said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. That everything we're doing, even included in technology, in some way goes back to everything else in the universe all of nature, all of humankind, we're all somehow connected. So I'd ask us in the Joomla world, let's focus on building profitable businesses. This is not going to be a session that says, let's all run out and start charities and nonprofits. Like, I want us to be the most successful business owners in the world. I really do. But I think that we can do that by also making sure that we leave the world in a better place than what we found it. Does that seem like a reasonable argument? Okay, so the world, you know, it's having some challenges and the folks here at JM Beyond, we can make our dent to help improve it and make it better, but I think we can agree there's some weird things going on in the world. Uh, you know, Northern Africa and the revolutions that were going on there, spurred by technology, right? Spurred by Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and all of this new technology and mobile handsets. That's, that's interesting. Uh, in France, we've seen a big change. We now have a, a socialist president in France, is that right? We've seen big changes there. Uh, we have a socialist president in the United States, it seems, some people think. <laughs> you type in socialist in Obama and you get very interesting photos. <laughs> Not all of them useful for putting here. But interesting how things happening in the US. The UK decided to go the other way and elected themselves a conservative. Our poor friends in Greece, any Greeks here? No, our thoughts are with the Greeks. Hopefully they made it home safely if they've left already. Crazy stuff happening there, and the rest of the world is asking themselves this. What the, what the blank is going on in this world? Uh, so how is change being made? How are we changing the world, changing the impact that we have on it? There's a couple ways this can be done. Uh, one way is through force by having and standing armies and forcing change upon others by brute strength. There's others that look to the law and policy and politic and say we can do this in maybe more diplomatic channels than force, uh, but ne not necessarily representing everybody, just representing the majority. I think what we're seeing here in the Joomla world is that we seek change through commerce. I am so impressed with the Joomla ecosystem and how we've built and embraced economic uh, resourcefulness, that we're not shy or afraid of saying great entrepreneurs that want to build fabulous extensions and templates should and should be encouraged to create and build these as products. I think that open source and GPL plus commercial extensions, add-ons, and templates are good for society and I think are great for our community. And we are carrying change through commerce. So that question then is, how can we build successful businesses while making the world a better place? 
So in the past, maybe the not so distant past, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, yesterday's business world uh, effectively had one mission statement. Greed is good. I don't know how many people have seen the 1987 film Wall Street, uh, but if you haven't, you should watch it after this presentation and recognize that 25 years ago is very different from where we are today. So that's, that's where we were. What did that look like in the glory days of capitalism for some people? Uh, that world had a mission of make as much money as possible. Build to flip. The United States and a lot of the other parts of the world found that not to necessarily be a great long-term investment. Uh, I had a chance to live in Silicon Valley during a lot of the dot-com era. Uh, I know others have been there since then. And to see businesses that were built specifically to be sold to the highest bidder as fast as possible makes my sustainable business stomach really, really ache. <laughs> Uh, we also learned that profits rule, uh, but most importantly, the shareholders rule. So if you're getting ready to sell your business or if you're looking for investment, you start to lose control of that business. And the shareholders and the people that own the business go well beyond just you. You need to make those shareholders happy. So what happens when this greed, if we say it, if we shall call it that, gets out of control? This gentleman, uh, Mr. Greenspan, uh, gave a, a remark, which I'll show in a moment, and part of the remark had the phrase, irrational exuberance. I think there was actually like an internet meme that came with like a Japanese song karaoke playing with him singing this. It was very odd, very funny. And I'm gonna take the time to just say these two screens because I think they're important. He said, clearly sustained low inflation implies less uncertainty about the future, and lower risk premiums imply higher prices of stocks and other earning assets, meaning that if there's lower risk, people are gonna to start to invest more in these stocks. But how do we know when irrational exuberance has unduly escalated asset values and then becomes subject, which then becomes subject to unexpected prolonged contractions? Like, how did he know? <laughs> he really knew what was going to happen and very few people listened because a lot of people were making money, building the flip, greed is good, let's go out there and make a buck as fast as possible. We're gonna be, we, whoever we is, will be at the top and everybody else, let's not worry so much about. Uh, so we ended up with a couple of bubbles. We had a nice tech bubble and then we had a really nice <laughs> housing bubble and, uh, from the United States to the rest of the world, we apologize. Um, but we uh, obviously saw that greed wasn't necessarily good for the world in the long term. It was good for the selling of x.com sock puppets, like the pets.com puppets, which I think became the most profitable thing this company ended up ever making after losing millions and millions of dollars. Um, and I asked this question, <laughs> Is a $1 billion purchase of a company that makes your decent photos look even less decent <laughs> really worth it? And does that mean that we are entering in or we are already deep into another era of irrational exuberance? The children, don't forget the children. I don't know if you hear about this in world politics, but a good American politician can always sit back on moral ground and say, we've got to do this for the children. <laughs> Except when it comes to financial policy, <laughs> which is who has the most money because I need them to fund my campaign. <laughs> and then we need to focus less on the children and more on corporations. So what about the children? What about the, the future, okay? So my argument for the future is that tomorrow's business world, or hopefully today's, needs to have two mission statements. People know what mission statements are for businesses. Is this, if I say mission statement, we generally know what I mean? So I say start with two mission statements. So one is a commercial mission statement. And to be honest with you, this is not very different from what we saw in the 1980s. We need to be able to use this to ask questions. How are we going to make money? What's our differentiator as a business? What's going to make us provide a unique selling proposition to other interested customers? But I also think a big change needs to happen. And I think 
the younger generation is pushing for this, and I think a Joomla generation is one that can really stoke this flyer, fire, and that is a social mission statement. And this is not something that is required by law in the US. I don't think any other country has a requirement of a certain number of mission statements, let alone a social mission statement. But I'm asking, how can your company make the world a better place? How can we protect the Earth's resources? And how can we not build to flip, but what I like to term, how can we build 100-year companies, not one-year companies, not 10-year companies? I want our community of Joomla developers, maybe we're not called Joomla in the future. Maybe we're doing something totally different because in 100 years, we have chips in our brains that are wired to the internet, I don't know. But we need to be thinking about building sustainable businesses for the long run. Even if you need capital investment to grow, even if you need to have shareholders to give you value so you can go ahead and do the things you really want to do, we can still build 100-year companies rather than companies that we're looking to flip and sell to the highest bidder. So one way we can do this is by thinking about aligning our values as businesses with those of our clients and customers. So if you look at some of the research coming out today, I just was reading over the course of the last few weeks some research that was coming out of, um, out of Hong Kong of uh, young people aged 18 to 25 and how are they making their buying decisions and what's influencing what they buy. Because that next generation is going to be shifting the way commerce is done. And younger people are making these buying decisions based on environmental impact knowledge based on understanding how this company is using our resources, using its labor pool to provide services. Um, we need to be careful as businesses that we don't go through a process called greenwashing, which is where you just use a lot of marketing speak to say, oh yeah, we, we have our servers that are green, whatever green might be. Now, it needs to be more than just saying the words. It's got to be actually acting on it. Um, there's certification opportunities in the US, and I've heard in other countries as well, of becoming a certified sustainable business. Um, so it makes it easier for these younger generation, and as well as other educated consumers, to make a decision to say, I want to buy from this company because they care about where our future is going as a community, as a world, as a, as a planet. And again, this is much more than just uh, the marketing speak. So what does, what does this look like? Two missions, not just one. I mean, are businesses actually doing this and can we in the Joomla world actually make this happen ourselves? Uh, this is a company called Tom's Shoes. Has anybody heard of Tom's Shoes before? Probably a few of the Americans, okay, and others. Um, so Tom's Shoes uh, started off, and you can see at the very upper left-hand corner of their website, with every pair of shoes, Tom, every pair you purchase, Tom's will give a pair of new shoes to a client, or to a child. <laughs> to a poor woman on the Upper West Side of New York's Manhattan District. <laughs> no, to a child in need. And they call it a one-for-one one model. Uh, they built their business and their mission 100% based on, we want to use capitalism to help make the world a better place. And we're gonna build that into our corporate documents and what we're doing from day one so that we can make sure it's just built into the model. It's not something we're thinking about for marketing. It's really, it's who we are. And that's going to attract great talent, great people that want to work for you. Uh, it's going to attract terrific investors that want to see you sustain for the long haul. And it's going to have great marketing, PR, and other playoff as well to increase sales and business opportunities. Uh, one other company that is a, a B corporation, which I'll talk about in a moment, is called Warby Parker. And they have a very similar concept uh, in that you buy a pair of glasses, and when you buy them, they give a pair of glasses to uh, a person who needs one. Most importantly, I think uh, a child that needs one. Uh, what's interesting about them is they're, ta they're taking that tack and it's built into their mission statements. But at the same time, uh, they're also producing really stylish glasses. Glasses that you would normally pay $300, $400 for, they sell at $99. So they're trying to be affordable, they're trying to reach as many people as possible. This is not just a, a consumer tax for the elite 
to feel like, oh, I did good because I, I paid extra for these glasses. You can build efficient, affordable business models and still make the world a better place. And companies like Tom's uh, and Warby Parker have, have shown that. Uh, in the U.S., there's um, a way that you can measure your sustainability and your effectiveness through a nonprofit called B Corporation. It stands for Benefit Corporation. And there's new laws in the, in the U.S. that allow companies not to just incorporate as for-profit businesses or non-profit businesses, but somewhere in this gray area of benefit corporations where it shows that stakeholder input from shareholders as well as um, a focus on the clients and customers they work with are directly incorporated into their articles of incorporation. So the whole world knows from investors to consumers, this company is built differently. It's built for both public good as well as consumer good. So they've written, we, uh, in their declaration of interdependence, we envision a new sector of the economy which harnesses the power of private enterprise to create public benefit. We work with open source software. Like the stuff we're doing hits this sort of interdependent statement directly, right? Like when we are contributing to an open source community, we are providing public benefit and public value. And most of us, I think, don't ask anything back for that. If we have gifts to give, we give them. And if we have an opportunity to make money, we can do that at the same time while enriching the knowledge of the world and helping make the, the world a better place. So there's a concept that allows businesses to do this called uh, a triple bottom line. Um, the three things that are included well, the one thing that's normally included in a bottom line, when you talk about it from a, an accounting speak, uh, is profits. At the end of the day, you take your revenues, you take your expenses, and what's ever left over when you subtract one from the other, that's your profit. That's the bottom line. That's how much money your company earned. A sustainable business, which I think will be more Joomla businesses over time, says, what about the other things that helped make our business successful? What about how we treat and how we focus on people? A fair and, benefic fair and beneficial business practices towards labor and community, and a focus on saying, I know that if I make a business that's really gonna take care of our local community as well as people overseas that I might never see, um, that's gonna have benefits back to us and that we can let the world know that we're doing something to make it a better place. Uh, on the planet, uh, sustainable environmental practices, uh, a concept called cradle to grave, meaning that when a product is produced, uh, I feel bad, but here I am with my iPhone. Uh, I don't really know how this was produced, but I know that there have probably been labor violations happening to people that I never get to see in countries that I've never been to that make me feel like, gosh, is this a good purchase? Can I influence companies to be more, um, more fair to their people and more fair to the planet when building these sorts of technologies? And then what happens when I throw away my iPhone in one year? <laughs> when Apple wants me to keep buying and changing, how do I make sure that there is some useful life to this that goes beyond just me using it and throwing it away? And building businesses think about people and planet as well as the profits, the, the value that you're creating is, is important to us. So just looking at my slightly winding path that I've been down myself, um, I think that I can share this with you and hopefully some of you can, this, this will resonate with you. This will make sense to you as well. Uh, so when I was at the University of California in Los Angeles at UCLA, uh, I was here, I passed by this building a lot uh, and I did public policy school for my master's degree. And uh, I thought, you know, universities, that's, that's where public change and social change is happening. People sitting down, thinking deeply, <laughs> trying to figure out how the world could be better. And, and then I kind of realized that that's not where it's happening. I said, okay, maybe where it's happening is somewhere in, in Washington, D.C., somewhere where policy is actually being created. So I said, okay, well, I'll have a chance to go to D.C. I had a, uh, a wonderful opportunity to, to work for a short time at the end of the Clinton White House in the White House's press office. Uh, that was a very interesting time to be in the Clinton White House. Um, 
This is being videoed, right? It was a great time. Uh, then I said, well, what's, maybe we need to go to the, uh, to the legislative branch. What's happening in, in the halls of Congress? Uh, and I realized that the halls of Congress are lined by young 20-year-olds with idealistic purposes that sometimes see the light of day, but oftentimes don't make it when the decisions finally get made for a variety of reasons. So then I thought, okay, well, gosh, it wasn't the universities, it wasn't in the White House, it wasn't in Congress. Uh, maybe it's in big businesses, maybe big corporations that have lots of money and lots of power. That's where social change is going to happen. These are the people that are influencing consumers. And then there was the bubble for the tech, and then there was the bubble for the housing, and then we've had a complete collapse of capitalism across most of the world. So I thought maybe that wasn't the place either. During the last five years, I think I found where it's at. It's in places like Joomla Day, Brazil, this last year. It's in open source communities like ours, where meritocracy, where the barriers to entry are low, where people have an opportunity to contribute their gifts and to be able to build a business off of it. I think that is where social change is going to be coming from. Open source software. This group of people right here is what's going to help change the world and move social matters into a whole new, more uh, triple bottom line focused perspective. And so I think the world of commerce is changing for the better. I think we have a wonderful opportunity to build businesses that will avoid bubbles, that will focus on people and planet and still allow us to be profitable. So people have heard me talk about this, that uh, motivation plus passion is what helps us build sustainable goodness. And for what we call at PicNet, uh, not for much profit businesses. Uh, it gives us an opportunity not just to focus on the bottom line, but thinking about something more than just profits. So key motivators. There's three key motivators that they found in uh, recent research over the last few years. One is autonomy, the ability for one to choose their own path in life. The second is mastery, that we all have a sense of wanting to do better or to learn something, be it the piano, be it all the sessions we were at today and yesterday, writing code and learning things we hadn't learned before. And then finally, purpose, that there's something either from a religious perspective or a philosophical perspective that says, we want to contribute to something that's bigger than us. We can't do it alone, which is why we are in a circle, which is why we are at JM Beyond, because we know that together we can do something we can't do on our own. So how can we incorporate this into our businesses? So this is where I'm gonna start shifting the discussion into what we can be doing for ourselves, how can we leave this building tonight and tomorrow start thinking about ways we can collaborate together and make the world a better place by building businesses with Joomla. So there's two potential business models that people typically follow, products and services. So the product model oftentimes looks like the, the Model T factory and assembly line here. Uh, we've got people that are building template products. So we have people that are building extension products. Can people think of other product-based businesses that are in our Joomla world? You don't have to name names, but types of product-based businesses. What do you think a product is? I can be psychologist. <laughs> okay. um, how about a pancake-type product? A pancake-type product? Mm -hmm. So something that can be really easily replicated through maybe automation. Easily replicated as automated as possible. Okay. And which is uh, not labor intensive uh, proportionally in the states. Excellent. I like that. I can't repeat that for the people at home, but it was really, really good. It was focused on building products less labor intensive, easy to replicate in sales. Did you have something back? Knowledge, Knowledge products as well. What was that? Training. So I, I may have uh, decided incorrectly, but in the services side, I also said that things like training could fit in services as well. Maybe it's customized training, but maybe there's productized training as well, where you've got a similar training that you're doing all the time, focusing more, as it was saying, on automation and an easy selling process. 
Uh, in addition to that, uh, things like support services, being able to provide other customized support as well as... That's service. Yeah, that's the service. Okay. It says no for this one. Yes for this one. What about any other service models? Because I can name like 100 right now, but any other Joomla-based service models? Yeah. Software as a service. What about like custom design or custom development? On service, on spec essentially. Anything else? People going to see real people. Right. Right, the people that are meeting in person and doing more labor-intensive, customized projects. Consultants, agencies, str uh, strategy services quite often. Okay. So of the slides that I showed you before, what, well, because we're losing time, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna answer my own question. <laughs> what do these kinds of businesses have in common? And I would argue that the commonality of all these firms is that they tend to focus on serving either one or two or possibly these three CMS marketplaces. But this is the reality of the world, that it's great that wonderful people are providing OS training, that are doing open support desk, are doing a variety of different things. But this is just a small segment of the marketplace. And I would love to see the wonderful businesses that are in the Joomla world be able to expand well beyond that and to share these talents beyond just the Joomla world. And if you need profits <laughs> to drive this argument, the simple statement is don't leave money on the table. If you have a really terrific offering, maybe there's a way that you can find to change the model to not just be selling to Joomla. What is a way in which we can move beyond that? And I'll talk about that as we move forward. Our ecosystem is obviously very unique compared to, say, the WordPress and the Drupal world, mostly because we encourage businesses to create products uh, that can be automated and sold very easily and then sell those at a certain dollar value. This kind of shopping mall that we have in the Joomla world gives us a leg up, gives us an opportunity to move into different sectors and to try different things that other communities are kind of locked into service models and the product model is a bit more difficult for them to go through. So thinking about the different revenue models that we've seen and we just talked about, we have models like this, the custom design and development services model, uh, and the revenue stream tends to look like this, kind of cyclical if you're lucky, going up and down, it really depends on when the deals come in, right? Uh, a retained support service model where you know you can count on revenue every month, but it really doesn't have a, an exponential growth curve, it tends to have a rather flat curve, and it tends to be flat because for every new client you bring on, you oftentimes need to match that with labor to keep up with it. So as you grow clients, you also have to grow the labor to match with it. And if you're lucky, the client goes up and the, or the expenditures for capital, human capital go slightly up less. Uh, and then there's the product delivery models where I think a lot of us in the Joomla world especially here at J and Beyond, uh, have some decent experience in and how we can build something that has a more exponential revenue curve and allows us to grow without letting expenses keep pace with revenues. So in the PicNet world, uh, we've traveled down all three of these roads and I wanna use ourselves as an example because I would want to encourage us in the Joomla world to think beyond just the Joomla sphere and to think about the metamorphosis of going between these different revenue models and thinking how we can change our businesses to become more profitable while at the same time becoming more uh, sustainable. Uh, so we went through the custom design and development process and we had done that and we saw great upsides uh, like once you get larger projects, those are really nice <laughs> and you get large checks and you can count on having the revenue to sustain the people you need to do a great job. Takes less sales to win so you, once you get your say 20 projects for the year or 30 projects or whatever you need, that's a lot less than the 1,000 you need to sell a $99 product or a $10 product. 
Some of the downsides, though, as we saw, you have a rather volatile sales model, right? It's constantly going up and down. If you're lucky, you know when it's going up and down, but oftentimes you have no clue. Uh, it has a shorter post-production relationship, so this strikes back to what I was talking about with sustainability. Uh, after you launch the site, if you're not doing support or hosting, oftentimes that, that might be it. You might never talk to that client again. They just might leave, and you might not be able to build a longer-term relationship to help them become more effective at what they're doing. And then finally, the net benefit to your sector. For me, it's the nonprofit and the advocacy sector. For you, it's maybe something else, your net benefit is close to zero for the public good. Unless you're able to take those goods and then somehow provide it open source in some way, oftentimes the key benefactor of your work is the client you're serving and that's it. For me, that's not necessarily the most sustainable way to help our larger ecosystem. It's a great way to serve a client and it's a great way to serve our own businesses, but not necessarily going to be the best model for us as a larger community. From a retained support service model, thinking about things like uh, increased financial stability, once you have a long-term contract, if I have a 12-month or 24-month contract with a retained support client, I know every month I'm going to be getting a check to make sure that we're keeping things up and running. It incentivizes us to do better projects, because if you do a better project, it actually will require less human capital after it launches, meaning that your expenditures will stay flat or maybe go down while your revenue keeps trending up as you bring in more support clients. Some of the downsides to think about though, there's the, the white knight challenge, which I say is, uh, you, you hear the stories of folks that are providing uh, support services and they hear from a potential client that says, oh, this horrible firm gave us this really awful website and we need you to save the day. And when you come in as that white knight to save the day, at first, you're looked at as like the savior. You, you helped fix everything. But suddenly, you have to take on all of the challenges of what the other firm did in the past. And that can be really difficult and you've put yourself in a position of unrealistic expectations. That you're able to solve one problem and you are the knight that saved the day, but who knows what's coming down the line. Uh, a pricing model that works right can oftentimes be difficult to find. Um, and again, the net benefit to your sector might be close to zero. You're providing a specific service to one specific client and maybe there's a way to strategize to provide that to a larger audience, but oftentimes it's, it's difficult to do that. And then finally, in a product delivery model, the basic upsides, I see uh, substantial net public value, the ability to have products that you can easily churn out, as you were saying, and at the same time possibly provide them at a, a low cost or free service to other organizations, while also having a rather predictable revenue model. I mean, if you're in, say, the pool and spa supply industry in Southern California, you know in the summertime people are going to buy chlorine tablets and, and, and penguins <laughs> for their swimming pools, uh, and you know in the wintertime sales are going to go down, so you can predict that as well. Uh, some of those downsides, though, is that oftentimes it takes substantial capital investment uh, and you need to move into some pretty intensive marketing efforts if you're going to sell a $10, $90 widget. So I want us to be thinking about moving beyond just Joomla because I think the product model as well as the services model is something that a lot of us um, might be dabbling in or might have some experience in, but I would love to see us hit that 80% of the marketplace that isn't using Joomla and what's a way in which we can make that happen. And our short story is we just started by only doing custom development for nonprofit organizations. And then we saw we're not really providing the net public value that we wanted. So we said, let's take this and move it into a software as a service model. Let's find a way to stop reinventing the wheel and lower prices by having an automated service for organizations. And then we started to do some work with uh, Salesforce and we realized that there was this whole world of organizations that already were using Drupal or already had a Dreamweaver site or 
God bless their soul, had a .NET or had a <laughs> cold fusion site. And we said, we can't help you make that better unless you just completely switch to Joomla. And they say, we don't have the money to do that. But what we really want to be able to do is we want to raise money online through donations. We want to be able to host events. We want to be able to do fundraising by individuals. And we're stuck in this cold fusion world. And right now, the only other option is a $10,000 custom investment or some somebody to come in and completely move their infrastructure to Joomla. And what we said is, well, why don't we use the Joomla platform and a slight part of the CMS and just provide that as a layer to be able to talk to something like Salesforce or some other tool that allows us to capture a marketplace that goes well beyond people that just happen to be using Joomla. So with that, being able to move beyond Joomla in a platform world, I think is going to be a lot easier for us. Because all of a sudden, you don't have to tell somebody you need to completely switch your CMS in order to be able to use the products and services that you create. Maybe you have community building tools. Maybe you have ways in which people can uh, give and raise money online or, or sell their products through a shopping cart. Not everybody's going to want to completely switch to Joomla to make that happen. And not everybody's going to want to pay you to custom install that or to build it. But maybe there's a software as a service model or other models that will allow you to use all of your knowledge in Joomla and provide a product that not necessarily requires somebody to drink the Joomla Kool-Aid maybe as much as, as we do. What this has provided for us is a really interesting challenge. And the, the challenge is this. Uh, if you're Coca-Cola, you will serve your Coca-Cola to Republicans and Democrats, <laughs> to socialists and liberals. Your audience and the people that you're serving are anybody who wants a brown-colored, sugary-watered <laughs> drink. And that's pretty much it. And what we found as we've been making this transition is that we as a company that's been really focused on helping nonprofits and sustainable businesses, it was tough for our team to say, how, how do we feel about serving folks that are not nonprofits or are not part of the local community that, that we're a part of? How do we make that happen? And to be honest, I think for us, moving from a custom development track to a product track, it, it's been a challenge. And I think it'd be great to, as we start to discuss some of this amongst ourselves, to hear other stories about how people may have been doing custom development when they first started Joomla and how they've begun making products and how that's changed the relationship they've had uh, with their uh, clients and prospective clients. So here's some things I'd like to do. We've got about 10 or 15 minutes left here. I'd love to have some discussion going on here. Uh, a couple of thoughts or questions that we can answer for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, one, who does your business serve and, and how? Are you serving just your clients? Are you serving the planet? Are you serving your employees? How do you do that? How do you keep and retain uh, human resources uh, as well as human knowledge within your business and make your business a great place to work? Uh, do you have two mission statements? I would suspect you might not, uh, but I'd love to be able to talk to folks that might be interested in doing that, or I'd love to see a coalition of Joomla businesses thinking, how does Joomla help make the world a better place? What's that public benefit that we can provide while also making money? And I'd love to start a group discussion on that at some point. How do you motivate uh, your team to reach their highest, ter or their highest um, potential in terms of autonomy and mastery and purpose? And what can we be doing as businesses to help make that happen? Um, has anybody here transferred their business models from, say, custom development to a product model? Uh, and then finally, uh, what are some lessons learned in growing beyond the Joomla community? I know some folks here um, come from uh, great hosting companies that have worked beyond the Joomla community and people that have done training beyond the Joomla community. How was that transition if you had one? Or how do you, how do you keep your feet in both of those worlds or the multiple worlds that you might be in? So we have about 10 minutes. Uh, I would love to open it up by asking if somebody would want to answer any of these questions, or if you have a question yourself about making the transition, or if you want to learn more from other business owners and entrepreneurs here. Any thoughts or questions on these up on the screen? Go of it and then uh, retraining because I feel at least in the US, a lot of people 
Yeah. Have, uh, her statement was, was saying, you know, being in an open source community allows us uh, to have a knowledge that goes beyond just owning a business with a bunch of worker bees or just workers that are going every day to like build the widgets and build the products and we have more of a collaborative background. Have other people in their businesses found that contributing to the open source community enables your employees or others to feel more connected or to enjoy their, their work better? Oh yeah. Which one? So Takedy Web Solutions is the service company that we started with. We were mainly doing uh, Mambo based work when we started. We transitioned to different types of technologies as, was, as far as the service was concerned. Two and a half years back we started with TechJoomla which was purely product focused and the biggest difference that we found while making this transition was that in, when you're making a product, you're making a much bigger commitment to the product, to the software, to the clients as compared to when you're building a service project. And now what we have realized out of the product development scenarios is now we are applying that back to the service business by also treating service business that comes in as a product. So in terms of service business, it's typically like a like client comes and if he goes, it's okay, it's one client that goes. But in terms of a product, you can't do that. You have to make sure that you support the product to the end, make sure that you keep on evolving, developing that software till it becomes the best that it can be. Whereas in a service, typical, especially in India, the typical service scenario is like, you know, the projects come in, you deliver, and it's the end of it. Whereas the product scenario taught us how to better your quality, how to make sure that the product evolves to its best. And that's, I mean, we have been able to use that concept to better our service business. And now we are treating everything as a product development cycle rather than treating it as a service, you know, take it and leave it kind of a cycle. So now we are looking at, you know, retaining even service clients as if we were building a product for them. So every website that we build or every web application that we build, we treat it as a product because in case of a product, there is much more ownership. Whereas in case of service, if, uh, I mean that, uh, I think it is important that even if you are developing for somebody, you feel that you own that project and that ownership is what finally makes you deliver much higher quality than you know you feeling okay I'm doing it for him whatever I mean he needs it fast so this is I'm giving you crap you want it fast right take it so we don't do that anymore we are like if you want it fast sorry we can't do it we can't lower your quality for you so that's what has the product business has taught us and I think that has gone a long way in bettering the way we work the bettering the way we think so Thank you. Oops. Uh, and I want to put uh, somebody like uh, Tina on the spot. So, or somebody else, or anybody who wants to speak on behalf of the, the folks of Red Ground, yourself. Uh, your, your name, please. Um, um, it would be part? great to hear you. It'd be great to hear you speak just briefly about what it's like serving multiple communities. You know, being here at the Joomla uh, events, but also you serve other open source communities. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> Okay, so serving different communities uh, for us means several things. First of all, um, in terms of architecture, because we are a, a hosting provider, I don't know how many of you know that, but uh, first of the things is uh, learning what this software does, <laughs> uh, what are the requirements obviously, and how we could actually host it on our servers and infrastructure. And uh, for some of the softwares, we often have to make uh, certain customizations in our um, server specifications. So um, that's the basics. And then from then on, uh, we go to the next step, which is the support, supporting the community, supporting the people who are actually using the uh, software. And uh, we start producing, um, during the process, when our supporters actually learn how to 
you know, to service this or to support this product, they usually start writing tutorials and knowledge-based articles that are publicly available for anybody, not just for our customers. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing. And then all other resources, such as for Joomla, we do templates for certain other softwares as well that could be useful to the community in general. But that depends on the software, on the complexity, you know, of the um, software. Because, uh, for example, for Magento, we are not going, you know, to make a template. But for Joomla, we are already so proficient, and we we spare resources for that. We think it's important. So that's it, you know. And, and I, I see Robert and Joe are hovering nearby, so I know we're probably running a little short on time. But one thing that I would, I'd like to ask is, anybody here um, implemented or put into play sustainable business practices into their business model, uh, thinking about the environment, thinking about giving back to the community, either the Joomla community or the larger community? Is anybody looking at, at least looking into that, maybe? Because I'd love to get some folks together that would be even interested in that, because I think that what we can be doing as a community is really spreading the word amongst businesses like ourselves to say, we're here in open source. We're all about community. We're all about doing more than just serving ourselves. And if there's a way we can do that uh, as a, a coalition uh, as of businesses that are looking beyond the bottom line, uh, I think we can really do some great um, social impact and provide social value to the, the rest of the world. So I thank you guys for your time. I know we're out of time, but if you are interested in learning more about triple bottom line or sustainable businesses, please come and talk to me and, and go off and do great work, guys. Thank you. <laughs>